In this video, I'm going to talk to you about how you should think about estimating an investment's cash flows. And the point that I'm going to emphasize in particular is how you should focus on an investment's incremental cash flow. So I'm going to talk about what incremental means and what costs or revenues are incremental and what are not. So recall that you can evaluate or estimate and investments cash flows using this equation. This is an equation that I've talked about in a previous video. If you haven't seen that video, click on the link above. This is an extremely important uh, equation which shows that for any long-term investment, you can calculate or think about its cash flows as the cash flows that you're gonna get uh, from its operations, net of any investments that you're gonna be making in long-term assets, which we call CapEx, and any investments that we make in short-term assets, uh, net of liabilities, which is basically changes in net working capital. Now, whenever we are looking to implement this equation to figure out an investment's cash flows, it is extremely important to focus only on those cash flows that are incremental, incremental to the project. And a natural question that you might be asking here is, what does that mean? What does it mean when we say, what are the incremental cash flows of an investment? Put simply, incremental cash flows are those cash flows that result as a direct, as a direct consequence of doing the project. In other words, they come about because you decided to do the project. So this is extremely important because oftentimes you will incur some costs that are not incremental, that are not being incurred as a direct consequence of the project. And whenever that is happening, we don't want to account for those costs. So one such cost is what is called a sunk cost. A sunk cost by definition is a cost that is already incurred and it cannot be recovered. So it's sunk, it's gone, it's done, it's history. Uh, sunk costs are not incremental to a project because by definition, they're already incurred. So let me give you an example. Let's suppose that you own a restaurant and you are now interested in launching, let's suppose a new cuisine, call it a Mexican uh, Italian fusion cuisine. Okay, and so you're interested in knowing, you know, whether people would like, I don't know, carne asada in their pasta or whether they'd like meatballs in their tacos or something. So you hire a market research company and you say, hey guys, I'm going to give you $3,000. Please go out there and spend the next month conducting surveys, trying to understand whether people would like Mexican Italian fusion cuisine because if I were to do this I need to set up the right sort of equipment I need to spend money on raw materials you know all that so I need to understand whether there's enough of a market out there now the market research company says okay we'll take your three thousand dollars we'll do the surveys and so one month later the market research company comes back and says yeah I think it it's it's uh, looking good you should go ahead and so now here you are at time period zero today and you're like, okay, today I'm going to have to spend some, let's suppose $20,000 on equipment, maybe an extra like $3,000 on, uh, let's make this $4,000 uh, in extra inventory. And oh, as part of the cost that I incurred in setting up this uh, new cuisine or restaurant, I should account for this $3,000 right? Because technically this $3,000 that I did in market research, uh, that's part of the cost that I incurred in setting up this restaurant. So while I'm sympathetic to you thinking about this $3,000 in this way, the fact of the matter is that this $3,000 is sunk cost. Whether or not you start the Mexican Italian fusion line, this $3,000 is gone it's sunk you've already paid this to the market research company put differently whether or not you decide to go ahead with this new project this three thousand dollars has been spent regardless so it is not incremental it is not a direct consequence of you doing the project right which is why you should not account for this in evaluating whether this uh, project is worthwhile or not 
So this is very, 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 very important. Sunk costs are not incremental to the project, which means that you should not account for them when calculating the cash flows uh, of an investment. Uh, market research is an example of sunk cost and other is R&D. This happens with pharmaceutical companies a lot. Well, let's suppose that over five years, a pharmaceutical company may spend a very well, like $20 million uh, researching some cancer drug. And now they're thinking, okay, here we are at the end of year five, should we go into year six? Should we spend another $3 million uh, into, uh, into R&D? And if you think about it in terms of like, well, I've already spent $20 million, what's another $3 million? That is wrong. Okay, that is that is a wrong way of thinking about it because this $20 million is sunk. It's gone. Okay, whether you pursue additional R&D or not, you're not going to recover this $20 million. So this should not factor into your decision about whether you should pursue uh, uh, additional investment in R&D on this cancer drug. A very, very important point. And this, uh, this uh, picture here sort of gets the same idea across. Just because this anchor cost a whole lot of money doesn't mean that it's now, not now time to throw it away. In fact, it seems like you should because the boat is sinking. And whether this cost one million or one dollar or 10 million doesn't matter because that cost is sunk. Another set of costs that are not incremental are allocated costs. So this idea of cost allocation is an important concept in accounting, in accounting, not so much in finance, but cost allocation is something that, especially if you have an accounting background, this is something that you've seen. And it takes the following shape. Uh, here's an example. Let's suppose that there is an office floor and it's got, uh, you know, nine, nine sort of spaces and uh, eight of those, which are shaded in yellow right here, right? These are already offices. And this ninth uh, space is vacant. And now let's suppose you're the floor manager, okay? And you're thinking about uh, starting a cafeteria here. Okay, so you're gonna start a cafeteria. And you're thinking, you know, whether this uh, cafeteria is a good investment or not. So you're interested in understanding, you know, how much cash flow am I going to get from this cafeteria in year zero, year one, you know, so on and so forth, okay? Um, now let's suppose that there is a security guard, okay, that already patrols this office floor. And the salary that you pay to this security guard is about $2,700 per month. Now, the way, uh, accounting works, the way cost allocation works is that if you were to go ahead and start this cafeteria, accountant would say, hey, you know what? This security guard, who patrols this entire office floor, he draws a salary of $2,700 per month because there are nine spaces. The proportion of the security guard's cost that should be allocated to this office space is basically $2,700 divided by nine. So basically $300. So put differently, uh, when you will do the accounting for this cafeteria, you will say, you know what? This uh, we expect sales of, you know, let's suppose a thousand dollars from this, and then the costs, you know, this cafeteria is going to have some costs and all that, and part of the costs is going to be the three hundred dollars, which is the security guard's uh, share of the cost that can be allocated uh, to this this cafeteria. So those costs are going to make their way when you're going to be doing the accounting for this cafeteria. This is how cost allocation works. But what I'm trying to emphasize here is the idea is that if you think about it, uh, the security guard's salary of $2,700 per month, you know, this security guard is getting that salary regardless of whether the cafeteria is there or not, right? What, and put differently, whether you start the cafeteria or don't doesn't change the fact that this security guard is already drawing this salary. So this salary is not incremental to the project, which means that when you're going to try and estimate the cash flows from this investment using this equation, you are not going to account for that allocated cost as part of the project's cash flows. This is extremely important because allocated costs 
are not incremental. Now, if it so happens that this security guard says, oh, the cafeteria, you know, I'm allergic to coffee smell, or, you know, I can't even be around an area in which certain sandwiches are made with like peanut butter because I have these allergies, like severe allergies. And therefore, if you want me to continue pursuing this, you know, I'm going to draw a salary of, let's suppose, uh, $3,500 per month. And let's suppose you do give him that salary. Then as a result of you uh, opening up this cafeteria, you know, the, the extra cost, the extra money that you're giving to this security guard, which here is basically $800, that extra $800 you're spending exactly or precisely because you started the cafeteria. This $800 would be incremental because it is resulting as a direct consequence of you uh, starting the cafeteria project. That is incremental but the other portion is not. So this is very, 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 very important. The way accounting works and how the accounting treats allocated costs is very different from how uh, financial managers should uh, think about cost allocation uh, from capital budgeting standpoint. Now, just like there are costs that are not incremental to certain projects and therefore should not be accounted for, you should also be wary of certain costs and revenues that tend to be incremental and therefore should be accounted for. So for example, one set of costs that you should account for are opportunity costs. Opportunity costs are incremental. What are opportunity costs? Opportunity costs are the costs that you pay in terms of opportunities foregone. So what do I mean by that? Let's suppose, again, let's take the restaurant example, okay? So you're thinking about starting your own restaurant and let's suppose you're gonna spend, uh, you know, $50,000, $50,000 here. Uh, this is investment that you're gonna make at time period zero in any equipment and whatnot. And then you're like, okay, if I start this restaurant, you know, this is the amount of sales that I'm going to generate. And then here are the costs and all of that. Now, while it is true that you should directly account for the costs, that you will pay for like, you know, cost of goods sold and all of that, wages and whatnot. It is possible that in order to run this restaurant, you have to stand behind the register. You have to do day-to-day -day stuff. And so there might be opportunity costs involved. Maybe you could have worked somewhere else and drawn a salary. It is because you're running the restaurant that you're not able to uh, draw those salaries. You would not, you're not able to work anywhere else. And so while from an accounting standpoint, remember those costs that you're paying in terms of opportunities foregone, they would never show up on your accounts, right? But when you are making that decision as a financial manager, you absolutely, you absolutely need to account for those opportunity costs. So here the opportunity cost would be any salary that you could have drawn elsewhere were you not uh, involved with the restaurant project. And after accounting for those costs, then you should think about whether this is, you know, a positive or a negative NPV or not. Uh, so opportunity costs are incremental because remember, the very reason why you're losing an opportunity is because you're pursuing this project. So opportunity costs are occurring as a direct consequence of you pursuing the project, which is why they should always be accounted for. So there are different examples. I just gave you an example of wages lost as a result of pursuing an MBA. So when you're thinking about not running a restaurant, but pursuing an MBA, you know, whether or not doing an MBA makes uh, good financial sense, when, you, when you're trying to make that decision, don't just think about the tuition fees that you're gonna pay and the extra salary that you're gonna get. Also think about the wages that you will lose out on while you're pursuing an MBA and therefore not working elsewhere, right? So opportunity costs, are incremental. Similarly, uh, even if you launch a restaurant on a pre-owned piece of land, you might say, oh, I already own this land. You know, I already have paid for this land. So there's no cost associated with it. I can just, you know, develop something on it uh, like a restaurant. And, uh, and so, so I don't need to account for uh, any investment that I, you know, made buying a land. But the fact of the matter is that had you not uh, pursued 
launching a restaurant on this piece of land, you could have sold this land. So there's a direct cost and opportunity cost associated with you pursuing the restaurant, which is that you can't sell this land. That land and its value, therefore, is an opportunity cost and must be accounted for as you're figuring out the cash flows that you're going to get from uh, making an investment in a restaurant. So long story short, opportunity costs are incremental. And finally, side effects of an investment are also incremental. What does that mean? Sometimes when you pursue uh, an investment, it can bring in revenues from other sources. Like for example, if General Electric is uh, thinking about making an investment in a new uh, turbine, for example, okay, so and they're going to spend like $3 million you know, manufacturing that turbine, and then they're going to make some sales of that turbine, and it's going to cost something. Yeah, so we can use all of that to determine the financial cash flows of this turbine. But as a result of this turbine, they might be able to um, generate extra revenues through their after-sales services. Maybe there's more revenue that comes in when clients call them and say, hey, you know, I need help with this turbine and all of that, so please... Uh, please, uh, please help me out. Those should, those cash flows should be part of your extra cash flows that you're going to get from this investment. If as a result of that turbine, people say, oh, this is an extraordinary, uh, turbine that General Electric has made and I want to buy some additional GE products, uh, then those extra cash flows are coming about as a direct consequence of General Electric you know, launching this particular turbine. All of those are side effects of this main decision and therefore should be part of your analysis when you're thinking about whether this uh, investment in this turbine is a worthwhile investment. So side effects are incremental. Uh, many times things actually work in the opposite direction. When, uh, when, uh, when, when Apple decides that it wants to launch like iPhone 13, for example, you know, and I, and you know, Apple is saying, okay, we're going to be spending all this money here at time period zero, you know, developing iPhone 13, and then we're going to be selling some stuff or selling iPhone 13. Uh, what they also have to account for is that when iPhone 13 will go out there, you know, people are going to be less inclined to buy iPhone 12 or iPhone 11. So uh, this is called uh, cannibalism, where the launch of one particular kind of a product cannibalizes or erodes the sales of your existing product line. And so when you're trying to understand, you know, how much cash flow you're going to get from iPhone 13, you, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to sell this, these many iPhone 13s. And so this, I only want to account for this. No, what you also have to account for are the lost sales that you're going to make as a consequence of launching iPhone 13. Uh, those are also incremental. Uh, cash flows because you're losing those sales as a direct consequence of launching iPhone 13. And so, so this is, this is very, very important. In fact, I was reading an article the other day, which is, uh, which was suggesting that, look, it's, uh, iPad from Apple seems to be cannibalizing or eroding the sales of MacBooks because now, um, there's some indication that iPad uh, is cannibalizing Apple Macintosh's business as more users are finding a tablet sufficient for their computing needs. And so this is an important point that when, when we are thinking about whether the next model of iPad is a worthwhile investment, we have to think about that, okay, we're going to sell these many more iPads, but then as a result, we're also going to lose sales on our MacBooks. And so whether or not this new model of iPad makes sense depends on the net effect, right? So all these side effects, whether there are synergies or whether there's, there's erosion, this all needs to be accounted for when you're trying to estimate the incremental cash flows of an investment. So in a follow-up video, I will try and show you through numerical examples how you can implement all these things in capital budgeting decisions. Thanks for watching.